Tele, what is this? Telesurenglish.net. Telesur HD. The headline is U.S. bans communist immigrants from ever becoming citizens. And I have to wonder if you're if you're government, how can you look into the heart and soul of another human being and determine if there really is an evil core of communism there or not? The line between good and evil runs through every human heart, after all. So let's see, how are they actually proposing this? New guidance on immigration laws released Friday by the United States Citizens and Immigration Service, USCIS, make it almost impossible for members of a communist or similar party to be granted permanent residence or U.S. citizenship. In a policy alert issued October 2nd, USCIS announced, in general, quote, in general, unless otherwise exempt, any intending immigrant who is a member or affiliate of the Communist Party or any other totalitarian party, domestic or foreign, is inadmissible to the United States. The policy amendment supposedly, quote, part of a broader set of laws passed by Congress to address threats to the safety and security of the United States effectively blocks members of the Chinese Communist Party, CCP, from ever obtaining permanent residency or citizenship in the United States. While the alert did not explicitly mention the Communist Party of China, which is more than 90 million members, that's actually really interesting, right? Out of a population of about a million in China, only 90 million are actually registered as Communist Party members and could impact millions more in Cuba, Vietnam, Laos, and elsewhere. You know, there are other places, all those 90 million, right? I mean, we're still talking roughly 10% of the population of China. Those aren't like party activists, organizers, leaders. For a lot of basic privileges that should be rights in China, you have to be a member of the Communist Party. Uh, oftentimes to start a business, to develop housing, to host events. Um, and I, I don't pretend to know the exact limitation, but there's a reason membership is actually as high as it is. And there are other countries where, in a sort of pro forma way at least, it's worse than that. Like if you're, you have to be a member of whatever party to vote. And even like in the United States, right? In the US, there are a lot of people who are neither liberal nor conservative and frankly hate both parties, but will register Republican or Democrat because they believe that their vote in the primary with that party in their area is more relevant, right? Like let's say you're a liberal uh, and you live in an extremely conservative area. You could register Democrat and vote in the Democrat primary as an exercise in futility, knowing that 99% odds the Democrat, whoever you nominate, is not going to win. Or you register Republican, and at least you have a say in the primary that essentially determines the winner of the general election, right? And there are other countries that have other similar such manipulations they leave people who aren't even communists to be communists in name only. Sinos? Kinos? Anyway. Well, the alert did not explain... Uh, let's see. Uh, the move adds a new dimension in Washington's ongoing aggression against the Chinese government and people and the left more broadly. The policy builds on laws dating back to 1918, which classified communists and anarchists as security threats into 1950 when the Inter Internal Security Act excluded foreign members of communist or totalitarian parties from becoming naturalized U.S. citizens. So there, there's this sort of, <clears throat> you know, obvious on its face problem with this is that someone could say, I want to come to the United States. And someone says, we can't let you in. You're a communist. I hereby denounce communism. I'm not a communist anymore. I want to be an American capitalist. I mean, corporatist. I mean, socialist. I mean, fascist. I mean, oh, wait, aren't you guys communists in the United States? What? What's wrong with this picture? And it's sort of like an identification issue. It's not, are you a communist? 
to see who identifies as a communist. There's no test for communism. It's a belief. Now, you can say that in the name of communism, you have committed crimes. In the name of communism, you have stolen property or murdered or assaulted someone. And in that case, even then, from a market perspective, your threat to society is not the bad ideas in your head, but the bad actions that they result in. Speaking of which, if America is going to say, if the American federal government is going to say, no communists allowed, they're going to have to define communism. So you wonder why they, they, they're they doing this, because they're, they're not defining communism. I mean, I'm sure in, the, in, the, in this whole league, there's, so there's a policy alert. Let, let's read the actual government document for a bit here. Um, let's see if we can if we can pull it up. Uh, the inadmissibility ground for membership in or affiliation with the communists or any other totalitarian party is part of a broader set of laws passed by Congress. I'm just leaning over. It's a really fine print. To address threats to the safety and security of the United States in general, unless otherwise exempt, any immigrant who is or has been a member of or affiliated with the communist or any other totalitarian party or subdivision or affiliate, domestic or foreign, is inadmissible to the United States. Now, okay, doesn't apl only applies to aliens seeking immigration status. Da, 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 yeah. So it's not, it's, you know, little, little, you know, legal limitations on this policy, of course. But here's the problem. They're basically saying anybody who publicly has or is identified as nominally a communist, or what, what is this, um, has been a member of or affiliated with the communist or any other totalitarian party. Guilt by association? I mean, if you catered one of their parties, are you? I mean, and in China, it's literally everybody. Even if you're not a member of the Communist Party, when it's 10% of the population that dominates pretty much everything, runs Uyghur concentration camps and camps and forces a one child policy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all of the communist violent crimes of the Chinese government, pretty much every Chinese citizen is associated or affiliated with the Chinese Communist Party. So they create a very subjective blanket policy here. But there's one other giant problem. Because are you communist if you call yourself communist or if you believe in communism and act on it? Because if I murdered a bunch of people and said, yeah, but I'm not affiliated with that gang or that murder club over there. And uh, what I do is, is really, uh, it, it's a early assisted end of life services that I provide to people, right? Then it doesn't matter if I call myself a murderer or not, I'm a fucking murderer. And the sad thing is just how fucking backwards this policy is. Because in other countries, people proclaim loudly, publicly, their communism and affiliation with the Communist Party in order to not get killed by authorities, in order to claim back some of their economic and social rights that are now privileges extended only to party members. Where in the United States, it's the opposite. And I hate to have to pull this up again, but I, I'll do it every time it's relevant because this is really important to point out and make you understand that I'm not just pulling this out of my ass or bullshitting or, or just making some whatever rhetorical point. How do you measure how communist something is? I think there's, there's sort of two ways. And one is the basic communist maxim from each according to their ability, to each according to their need. And if you look at how many rich assholes there are in China, not a very communist country, not by that measure. 
And in the United States, uh, we got our fair, ability, our fair share of billionaires here too. But that's actually an inconvenient side effect of Marxism that Marxists don't like to mention, that when you create a central authority, it's going to be corrupted and you're going to end up with unjustly rich people who have basically stolen their wealth from the American people. But there's number two. There's a second way that you can actually measure, although somewhat subjectively, how communist a country is. And you can just look at the 10 planks of the Communist Manifesto. And this is laissezfaire-republic.com slash 10 planks.html. And I have referenced this website multiple times on the show. And in social media, I mean, I just, you want to argue with people on Twitter. We live in a free country. We have a capitalist system. Oh, really? Ask them, first of all. How many planks are there in the Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx? They probably won't be able to answer that question. But the follow-up question is the important one in order to measure how communist is the United States. How many of the 10 planks of the Communist Manifesto are in effect by the United States federal government? Number one, abolition of private property and land and application of all rents of land to public purposes. Sort of needs to be translated from the political speak of Karl Heinrich Marx from 1848. But uh, we have eminent domain. We have property taxes. We have the government claiming to own 50% of the land west of the Mississippi. And we haven't abolished the concept of private property but we've turned it into a pretty thin illusion. You think you own your house? Well, odds are the bank owns it. You think you own your land, even for me, where I pay for it all cash up front? Well, if I don't pay my property taxes or fill out the right forms to get out of them, yeah, they come and take my property. Two, a heavy, graduated, a heavy progressive or graduated income tax, pretty self-explanatory, we got that. Three, abolition of all rights of inheritance. We're kind of partial on that with the death tax. Four, confiscation of the property of all immigrants and rebels. Oh, yeah, we've got that. Can't leave this country even with uh, with more than $10,000. you got to convert to Bitcoin, then send it out, then go get it, right? You're not allowed to leave. You, when it comes down to it, if you, if you have money, look look into this. You're not allowed to leave America or renounce your citizenship without giving the government a big chunk of that money. Five, centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank with state capital and an exclusive monopoly. Well, here in the United States, we have the monopoly on creating legal tender money through the Federal Reserve System, that fiat currency. Now, is it control, full control or centralization of credit in the hands of the state? Uh, when you have a banking system backed up by the FDIC, Federal Department or Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, and you have the violence of the federal government forcing the Federal Reserve System on everyone and through that fractional reserve banking that grows up around its subsidiary banks in the system, yeah, it's not unfair at all to call this centralization of credit in the hands of the state. Number six, centralization of the means of communication and transportation in the hands of the state. Well, without government, who would build the roads? Oh yeah, we the people. When government is has centralized the means of transportation, uh, at least in this major infrastructure, yeah, that's communism. When you have the people do it or the market do it, that's freedom. We got the FCC, uh, Interstate Commerce Clause, so many other laws that uh, that back this one up. Seven, extension of factories and instruments of production owned by the state, the bringing into cultivation of wastelands and the improvement of soil generally in accordance with a common plan. Now, uh, this article says, while the U.S. does not have vast collective farms, which failed so miserably in the Soviet Union, we nevertheless do have a significant degree of government involvement in agriculture in the form of price support subsidies, acreage allotments, and land use controls. The Desert Entry Act and the Department of Agriculture, as well as the Department of Commerce and Labor, Department of Interior, the Environmental Protection Agency, Bureau of Land Management, Bureau of Reclamation, Bureau of Mines, National Park Service, and IRS control business through corporate regulations. And I'm surprised they don't point out here that, yeah, federal government, owns 50% of the acreage in America west of the Mississippi. 
Number eight, equal obligation of all to work, establishment of industrial armies, especially for agriculture. Here we have the Social Security Administration, the Department of Labor, and the goal of 100% unemployment instead of what the goal of a free society should be, which is 100% retirement. You should have the economic capabilities, security, and freedom to make work optional, to be an entrepreneur, to be an artist. The world would be such a better place, and we've really come to that point. Then there's the Equal Rights Amendment, where women are essentially now expected to work the same as men. That's not natural. I mean, yes, it's natural for women to work, don't get me wrong. But the way that government uh, devalues women's ability to, to, to make babies by saying you should work like, like men, I won't wade through any deeper piles of shit on that subject. We'll just leave it at that for now. Nine, combination of agriculture with manufacturing industries, gradual abolition of the distinction between town and country or by a more equitable distribution of the population over the country. This is something I, I would actually say is kind of wrong in the United States. It doesn't apply to the United States. Um, so, yeah, we're still at eight out of nine points. Uh, I think there's a, there, there, there has since Karl Marx been a greater incentive by the super class to herd people into cities and to concentrate populations rather than spread them out. But here in the United States, we do still have a version of this. We call it the Planning Reorganization Act of 1949, uh, zoning, blah, blah, and super corporate farms, as well as, as executive orders that create the 10 regions. And uh, yeah, there's, there's certainly plenty of government intervention in this area, even if it's not in the direction of communism. So I I'll give America a, a, a very small partial point for that one. Number 10, free education for all children in government schools. Abolition of children's factory labor in its present form, combination of education with industrial production, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, we got it. So, you might say, Adam, well, some of these are partial. You're kind of arguing not that they're completely in effect. And that's true. And I mean, number 10, free education for all children in government school. Yeah, we are. We, we get the full point on that. But uh, you know, what, what are we, nine out of 10, effectively? Planks of the Communist Manifesto in effect in the United States in a meaningful way. And there's some people who will try to deny this and say, but Adam, look at the economic freedom you have as an individual. Well, even under complete communism, they can't control everything. You still get to choose what clothes you wear, right? But if I was going to make you a hamburger, and instead of putting a big, juicy meat patty in it, I took out 90% of the meat and replaced that 90% with shit. And I handed you that burger and said, oh, here's your burger. Enjoy. Would you even let me call it a burger or would you call that a shit sandwich? So when you look at America, honestly, through this perspective, you go. Yeah, the United States is a communist country. All right. Maybe you can say partially communist. Maybe I don't think you can say partially. You have to say mostly communist. And even if you wanted to step back and analyze this not by categorical planks in the Communist Manifesto, but how much economic value is being directed by government rather than market forces, creating distortions that re release or excuse me, re uh, result in serious reductions in quality of life for every single American. You got to say, this is at least a majority communist country. Yeah, sorry. I mean, you can talk about the 10% of your burger that's not shit and pretend like it tastes good next to a pile of shit. But there's a certain dangerous denial in taking that perspective. And that's why when I cover a story like this, U.S. bans communist immigrants from ever becoming U.S. citizens. I'll believe that they mean it when they strip citizenship from every politician in Washington, D.C. who contributes to the communist policy in America. We got a comment. I'm a statist. No communists. What are we going to do about the Republicrats already here? 
Well, I think taking an honest perspective and identifying them as communists is actually helpful. And I, you know, even to myself at first, when I took on this line of messaging, it did sound like a little bit of sensationalism. And if I just say, America is socialist and communist and, and fascist and down with America, you know, yeah, you're kind of missing the point. And it's when you reduce it to that sound point with these words that, I mean, you went to a government run school, but most Americans you did. And you can't define the word government. And I know this from my own research, and you call it anecdotal, but I've spoken to hundreds or thousands of people when I was touring and doing man on the street videos. So, all right, you support government. What is government? Can you define that term for me? Don't describe it. Define government. Oh, the people in charge. Wrong. The only legitimate definition for government is that it's a territorial monopoly on the initiation of force, which, of course, deserves a, a little bit of unpacking. You know, territorial, it claims a land where it has authority. And it cl claims uh, a unique monopoly within that authority for being the only people allowed to use violence or coercion against peaceful people, right? If, if I go up to you and, and, and put a gun to your head and say, give me half your income, uh, I'm, I, I go to jail. If I'm an IRS agent and through paperwork using cops to point the guns at you to do essentially the same thing, I get a promotion and a paycheck. And so these three terms, socialist, communist, I'm going I'm to go ahead and pull these up for the benefit of my audience today, since we haven't done this yet. I was at socialism, communism, and fascism. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually give you these definitions and show you that I'm not twisting words or being sensationalistic, I'm trying to get America to face reality. And part of this reality first is admitting how much we've been lied to and misled. We don't have a two-party system in this country, except in some functional ways. It's an illusion. We have an illusion of a two-party system that covers up the fact that we really have a one-party system. It's the American Socialist Party. And you can choose between red-flavored socialism and blue-flavored socialism. The definition of socialism, according to Google, a political and economic theory of social organization which advocates that the means of production, distribution, and exchange should be owned or regulated by the community as a whole. Now, you can argue that you could start your own business, uh, that you could distribute and exchange without government interference, but except for secret, off-the-record exchanges, pretty much every economic exchange in the United States is at least in some way regulated by government, which here pretends to represent the community as a whole. But that's, yeah, you'd call that pretty soft socialism if you just go, well, everything's regulated, but it's all sort of uh, common sense regulation. None of the corporate favoring regulation or bank favoring regulation that you have in the United States. But means of production, distribution, and exchange owned by the community as a whole. Who owns the roads? Who owns the military? Who owns corporations? Government licensed entities, right? But to own something really means to control it and to have that control respected by the people around you, by society. And so we generally accept that government owns all of these things and when it comes to what is what are the means of production and this is again defining capitalism properly capitalism is an economic system based on ownership of the means of production the ultimate means of production is you the individual human mind and if your self-ownership isn't respected there's no capitalism if we have a government that acts like it owns us i mean just the drug war the government says we're going to decide what's okay to put in your own body, not you. Well, guess what? At that point, your self-ownership is not being respected. All right, can you get that? There's, there's a comment, Mercedes. Do you want me to read that on the air? I'm a statist. I love 
trolling the Republicans with DOS Capital uh, when they argue we need regulation industry. Every argument they use against it is covered in Marx's books. Or Marx's book, yeah. Uh, I don't think that's Dad Capital. I think that's an autocorrect. DOS Capital uh, or Mein Kampf. But yeah, all of the, and, and this is again really important to point out that Republicans and even conservatives, so first of all, the definition of conservative has become pretty meaningless, right? Conservative is sort of like this vague general body of thought, but there is a definition which means a political philosophy intended to conserve existing social institutions. Well, if existing social institutions are socialist, then to be a conservative is also a socialist in your country. Yeah. So if you're an American and you call yourself a conservative, you're really saying that you're a socialist, communist, fascist. I must say socialism is a transitional stage of communism, as Marx described it. And that's an interesting point. But you heard me do the 10 planks, right? We already have all 10 planks of the Communist Manifesto, at least partially in effect in the United States. So communism, aside from the planks, the definition is a political theory derived from Karl Marx advocating class war and leading to a society in which all property is publicly owned and each person works and is paid according to their abilities and needs. So I will admit that your shit sandwich still has some tomatoes and onions and maybe a little bit of lettuce and a bun and, you know, the shit, you know, well, only on the bottom bun does the shit actually get into the bread. But, you know, it, we're, it, it's not like the entire sandwich is made of shit yet. Uh, it's not that all property is publicly owned, although there is essentially a government claim to all property through eminent domain in this country. So, you know, it, it, it's a little bit subjective, but, you know, I, I'd say that we're, we're at very least most of the way there. In fact, the parts of non-communism or the elements in America of, of governance and society that are not communism are left as excuses to say, oh, we're not communists. Look, you can still have the American dream and bootstrap and become a billionaire. Yeah, you can become a billionaire if government lets you and wants you to have that kind of money. So the last term. Can I make this stretch? Can I get you to see what I see that technically, to, to apply this term, that technically America is a fascist country? Well, we're going to look at the de dif dictionary definition, uh, but we're also going to look at one of fascism's most prominent historical proponents, Mussolini. Now, the definition from Google via Wikipedia. Well, see, let's go to um, let's go to Merriam-Webster. Yeah, yeah, maybe maybe more clear definition. I really don't like it when people don't know what definitions are or act like it when they don't know a definition and they just try to substitute a description for a definition. And this isn't just some linguistic pet peeve of mine i see this continuously in modern american politics and even just covering the news so fascism by miriam webster is defined as a political philosophy movement or regime such as that of the fascisti that exalts nation and often race above the individual and that stands for a centralized autocratic government headed by a dictatorial leader severe economic and social regimentation, and forcible suppression of opposition. Now, I will tell you, I will give you that, that one thing that, that we do pretty well in America is at least pretend to live up to an anti-racist ideal, right? At least sort of codified in government. Uh, we don't glorify racism except in, you know, dog whistles that, we're a white Christian country. No, I, I, I got to say, you know, good for America. At least that part of Americanism was not perverted like 
the whole freedom thing being turned into militarism and central banking. And if you're black, you're only worth three fifths of a person. Well, I guess there was a race element there. Huh? So, but a regime that exalts nation. Oh yeah, certainly a nationalist country here. Above the individual, oh yeah. How do you think they convinced me to sign up to die for politicians as a U.S. Marine? And even if you didn't fall for it, the vast majority of Americans accept that if you die in combat, you're not, as you are in truth, serving bankers and politicians and war profiteers, uh, but that you're somehow dying to serve the nation. And so the nation is exalted above the individual. Stands for a central autocratic government. Maybe before COVID, uh, the Karen of virus turning everybody into Karens, you could kind of make the case that our federal government is not autocratic. But there's no way around it. Certainly not now. You, in this day and age, there's no way denying that we have a centralized autocratic government headed by a dictatorial leader. Now, when you look at the evolution of government historically and the shift away from monarchies, and you examine what really is a monarchy as a form of government, you say rule by the monarch. That's not really accurate so much as symbolic. In every major monarchy in human history, it's really been an oligarchy. No individual sovereign king or queen has been able to single-handedly run a government or a country or an economy without an oligarchy backing them up. Financiers, political operatives, consultants, but a cadre of people around them who help wield that power, who would better be described functionally as an, as an oligarchy rather than a monarchy. So a monarchy is really just an oligarchy with a, a symbolic figurehead, right? I mean, look at Caesar. You disobey the oligarchy, even as king, emperor for life. What happens? They fucking kill you. Wait, did I need to go far that go that far back? Oh yeah, JFK. Okay. So, would I say that America is headed by a dictatorial leader, and sort of try to give Trump credit for being that dictatorial leader? Nah. But we have a dictatorial leader in the form of the oligarchy that runs America. Severe economic and social regimentation. Now you might say, well, social regimentation you have to define broadly to really apply that to America pre karen virus, but post karen no. Nope. Severe economic re re regimentation, oh yeah, we've had that from the beginning. You're going to pay your taxes on time, you're going to fill out your forms, you're going to go to your nine to five, you're going to work for regulated industries, big businesses that are approved by government, oh yeah. Now, for me, as, an, as, a, as a creative, you know, as an activist, author, media producer, I get to have a unique perspective and say that I've kind of escaped this. But again, you look at the economic lives, jobs of most Americans, severe economic regimentation might be putting it mildly. The last thing, forcible suppression of opposition. Chelsea Manning, Ed Snowden, Julian Assange, Everybody that was ever locked up by false accusations through the FBI's COINTELPRO program as activists, all the assassinations by cop, not to mention current censorship, which is rampant. It's uh, part of the Karen culture, cancel culture, where if I don't like something, I'm not just going to accept that I don't like it and other people who like it might watch it or see it or whatever, or read it. People still read, you know. Uh, there is a government suppression uh, of opposition directly and through corporatism as we experience 
in social media and uh, on YouTube in particular. If you don't believe me, there's a reason CJ calls me the most sense or most shadow banned man, uh, most shadow banned channel on YouTube. And you look at how many subscribers we have versus how many views we get. And how much we get ripped off on compensation, even for the views that we do get, you go, yeah. Some of the suppression of opposition in the United States is by deception, by fraud. When YouTube says, oh, yes, we have a fair open platform and follow our community guidelines, which are subjective, meaningless, and give us an excuse to censor anything we don't like. If you follow our community guidelines, Anybody can can post content on YouTube, and if you follow them, if you subscribe to their channel, and you come to our homepage, we'll show you what you subscribe to. You'll have a feed, and and if you set up notifications for a particular YouTube channel, then yeah, we will uh, we'll we'll send you an alert. Unless we don't like that channel's content, and that's a form of suppression of the opposition if you say well adam that's a private company yes you can make that case however the current corporatist reality in the united states is that that company would not exist as is without the intellectual property racket and corporatism protecting it from competition and all the other corporatist policies that lead to conglomerate conglomerization that is companies combining because big ones buy out small ones like facebook bought uh, Instagram, and WhatsApp. So when the force isn't there directly, it's pretty well hidden. But you got to ask yourself, you know, where is the gun in the room? If I do what I need to do to challenge this, where do I get stopped? Well, go ahead. Try to start another business based on Facebook's model and say, we're going to be like Facebook, but without the manipulation. They might not put a gun to your head, but if you persist after so many cease and desist letters, eventually you will be forcibly stopped. And so we have that in the United States. And I know this has been a bit of a long segment to get into this one news story. But I, I have to say, I am, I am genuinely offended and i know being offended is fucking bullshit but i'm offended not that they're doing this but that they are so twisting the language as to be able to get the average american to accept living in a fascist communist socialist country and, and believe politicians when they say essentially well no it's it's not fascism it's not communism it's it's not socialism when we do it I think it's worth taking time to, to help break America out of